I'm John Ridley and uh, I've been a Muslim for about 30 years. I live in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, where I work as an engineer and also as a journalist across the Middle East. My home actually is in England uh, on the south coast where I, I live with my wife and son. I was born and raised in a very small Somerset town uh, in the rural part of England and uh, my parents and my sister still live there. We were a, uh, a fairly relaxed Christian family. Uh, we went to church from time to time, maybe every three or four weeks, but there was no compulsion. Uh, I, I went because I, I did believe in a God, but as I grew older and started to question and wanted to understand more about Christianity, there were, there, were, there were gaps in my understanding and I could never fill those gaps. I would ask questions of, the, of my family and of the ministers at the church and they were things that just had to be accepted. There was no question, you couldn't discuss them. Uh, and I could never understand and accept that if a faith, if you had a faith but couldn't question and understand the faith, to me, the, the faith was missing. There was something wrong with that. And I'm still hoping that maybe one day someone, well, somebody will explain to me what those missing uh, parts of, my, of, of Christianity are. Uh, in particular, the, the Trinity. I could never understand how God could have these three parts, one of which was human. And also there were some, what I felt were quite dreadful teachings, uh, such as um, original sin. How can a child, a newly born child, inherit his parent's sin? It just made no sense, and nobody was able to explain those to me. By the age of 20, I, I knew that I believed in God and uh, I had my doubts, but I'd never really left England and knew nothing of the world outside. And so I, I didn't even know of any of the other religions apart from the briefest of study in school. So I went ahead and uh, was confirmed into the, into the church. A couple of years later, I was working for the BBC uh, as a broadcast engineer, and I had the opportunity to, to take a six-month uh, a secondment to, to the Middle East. And this was to be my first real adventure of my life. Uh, so within 24 hours, I'd left Broadcasting House and rural Dorset where I worked, and uh, was transported to a small desert island off the coast of Oman, on the island, there was a small British community uh, of BBC personnel and also some RAF personnel. And they'd built a very small makeshift church. And there were probably 10 or 15 of us would go every Sunday. And so I, I joined, joined into the services. But after four weeks, uh, I attended the service as usual on the Sunday. And we came to reciting the Nicaea Creed. And I will never know why, but I couldn't say it. I just froze, I was in a cold sweat, and I just knew that what everybody was saying was blasphemous. So after four weeks on the island, I stopped going to church. And, and that left a large hole in, 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 in my faith. I suddenly felt that the church that I'd chosen to embrace wasn't actually what I wanted. It wasn't look, it didn't answer the questions. The doubts came back. And so I started talking uh, during my, my long hours of shift work uh, with, with the BBC. Uh, I'd start talking with the Pakistani staff and the Omani staff who were Muslims, not specifically about religion, but I wanted to know about their culture and their life. And slowly the subject of religion came in into our conversations. And inevitably, it came up, you know, the questions came up as to why did I have difficulty with Christianity and the, the, the subjects of the Trinity and original sin and the other doubts were, were raised in conversation. And I was shocked because the answers from every single person that I spoke to were always the same. Islam doesn't believe in these things. 
you know, there is no such thing as the Trinity. God is not his son. Uh, God is God. Jesus was a prophet, a human prophet. There's no such belief in, his, in original sin. Everybody is born pure and they, it's up to them how they choose to lead their life. So the questions I had about Christianity were suddenly answered by Muslims in a completely different country. And this left me very, very confused. I really, I, I didn't know where to turn because everything that I'd been brought up with, the doubts that I'd lived with, were thrown straight back at me and I was suddenly searching for answers again. So for three and a half years whilst I was in Oman, I, I studied and studied, I, I talked with people. And then eventually, after a couple of years, uh, I, I had a strange request from the, from the Wale of Mazira. He was the mayor or the leader of the island where I was working and living. And he told me that I was going to be going to Muscat to meet the, the Minister of Islam, the, one of the most senior ministers in the government. A couple of weeks later, I was on the plane and uh, introduced to, to the Minister of Islam. He and I were probably talking for the best part of an hour, and we recapped the past couple of years about all the questions I'd had, the answers, and he was challenging, challenging the, the, the conclusions I'd come to. He, he, he was testing me. As the conversation went on, he realised that I'd been there for three and a half years and was soon to go home. And so the, the, the inevitable question came up, well, what are you going to do when you go home? How are you going to feel about this? Where does this leave you on, on this journey? And I have to admit that I was somewhat bemused because I didn't really know where the next stage of the journey was. But I made the decision at that point that it was time to recite the Shahada, which I did. And uh, I wasn't, fr from there on, I, I, I found that I was completely on my own. Within a couple of weeks, I was back on the plane to England and suddenly I had no one to talk to, no support. I was completely isolated. When I came back from Oman, I spent a few weeks with my parents uh, because I'd been away for so long. And there, there clearly were changes. The Middle East had influenced me in many ways. And also, I'd made a, a decision and uh, I wasn't eating pork. Th that may sound of, of little significance, and to me it was of no significance. But it was a, there was a realisation on the part of my family that something had changed, which they didn't like and couldn't accept. In, in, in many respects, the, the, the not eating pork was, was an indication of how things had changed. But no matter how you tried to a, approach the subject of, of embracing Islam, it was never accepted. And, and a conversation with the family could never take place it wasn't acceptable that somebody had moved from traditional Christian beliefs into, into, uh, into Islamic beliefs. And so really an, an in-depth conversation on, on why I chose that, made that change, never took place. And even to this day, 30 years later, We've never had that discussion and I don't believe it will ever take place. Which I think is sad because I'm not asking them to embrace what, I, what I've chosen. But I think it would be very nice if they would try to understand that I don't th that's never going to happen. Work was becoming more and more difficult to find in England and so I had to start looking elsewhere for, for, for an income. Uh, and a, a job came up in Saudi Arabia, which, after a lot of soul searching, I decided to take. When I got to Riyadh, I started to meet more and more Muslims, and socialising with, the, with them rekindled my interest in, in Islam, which had become very much dormant. And so I would start to 
to, to, to gain question and that led to a lot of further study of, of Islam. So, so this was 2002 and 2003. Well, in 2003, America invaded Iraq. And, and so the, we, we entered a period of great political instability in the Middle East. This was also a period of great instability within Saudi Arabia. In May 2003, I, I witnessed a suicide bombing of one of the European compounds and where some 30 people were, were, were killed. I knew many of those people. Before the shock of what had happened hit me, the bomb had gone off and I just bowed down. I just knelt down and, and prayed, which was very unusual because until that point, I really hadn't done this. I started to go to the mosque where at work and in my home where I would spend a lot of time sitting and thinking and praying. This was the turning point. Until that point, even though I'd embraced Islam, I really hadn't practiced. It became a turning point in my life. From, from Riyadh, I moved on to, to, to Kuala Lumpur, where I spent a year and a half. And then I moved on to Tehran, where I spent another 18 months. In both of those cases, I was able to experience different Islamic cultures, which again helps you to, to build your faith and to, and to understand more about what is Islam and what is local tradition. After Tehran, I moved to, to Yemen and the UAE, where I spent many months. Um, and from there, I moved back to, to, to Riyadh. And now I was lucky enough to be able to, to visit Mecca three times. Visiting Mecca changed my life, but it wasn't a spiritual change. I wanted to share the experience with my friends and family. And the only way I could do that was to write the story of the journey that I'd taken. After a couple more years in Saudi Arabia, I moved on to to, to Jordan. And by now, I was writing professionally, although it was still part-time. As I was in Jordan, it made sense to do some research into, into Palestine. And I was sure that I could write one or two articles about the subject uh, for, for, for newspapers. Bakar, one of the main Jordanian camps, was just a couple of miles outside of Amman. And so I persuaded one of my friends to take me there so that I could look around. What I found in the camps was that four generations had grown up with little hope of escaping the, the poverty, let alone reaching their potential as human beings. I was shocked by the, by the unemployment, the overcrowding, and the dark alleyways and, and the, the sewage systems that were unable to cope with, with the demands placed upon them. And this, this leads to some of the most dreadful diseases. And no matter how that the residents try, they cannot keep the the camp clean and, and disease free. Every camp I visited would highlight further horrors that these people had suffered. Um, but perhaps most profound for me was Sabra and Shatila, which, was, which is infamous for the 1982 massacres. And on the surface, the, 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 the camps look to be quite normal and well, well presented. But as you start to interview people, and I, I realized that the things weren't quite as they seemed. And I was able to, to finally get permission to go into some of the, 
the back streets of the camps. And again, I was horrified by the conditions. If you can imagine block, apartment blocks, ramshackle apartment blocks, four, five, six stories high, separated by just one, one and a half meters, light never, ever reaches the ground. They are damp and dark, and they stink of, of decades of, of damp. People have to live in these conditions, and disease is, is, is rife. And as with, with Bakar and all of the other camps, no matter how the residents try, they cannot keep these places clean. They cannot, they cannot bring up children without mortality rates, which are just incomprehensible. And so I found that I want to write more and more about the Palestinian uh, situation and, and bring this to people's attention. Because unless people do understand, then nothing ever is going to change to help the, the lives of, of 4.7 million people in Syria, Jordan and Lebanon. I've been very lucky that I've lived in the Middle East for the best part of the last 30 years. And I've lived all over the, all over the, the region, everywhere from uh, Saudi Arabia to the UAE, down to Yemen and across into Iran. And, and that's given me a, a terrific insight into the different countries and the different cultures, which I, I think I'm probably one of the few people that have had the opportunity to experience so many cultures and different parts of, of, the, of, the, of the region. But all, all, of, all of those countries have their own, own beauty in some particular way. But Yemen, for instance, is just, just beautiful. The, the scenery uh, out of the cities is it, it, it is, is gorgeous. Uh, mountains, green mountains, almost almost like the Pyrenees in France. Um, truly, truly breathtaking scenery. Compare that to, to, to the to, to, to the Emirates, which is a desert, um, or Saudi Arabia, which is desert, and then go across in uh, east over into Iran which again uh, has desert regions, but it's, it's beautiful green countryside throughout part of, you know, part of the country. But Le Lebanon is, is very different. Le Lebanon has a history as well as, as, well as the, um, uh, as well as the natural beauty of mountains, snow-capped mountains going down into the Mediterranean. It's also got an incredible history, a biblical history. It is part of the Holy Land. Everywhere that you turn in Lebanon, there's another story to be told, be it, be it one of the biblical characters, or, or be it the, the people who, had to, who suffered and lived through the civil wars. We, we experienced, they, they've all experienced their own story. And these are stories that, as part of my work, I'm trying to find out more about. So I'm interviewing a lot, of, a lot of residents of Beirut and the other towns and cities at the moment, trying to understand more about how their life uh, was changed by the civil wars. What did they do in the wars? Some of those people were fighters. Some of them were just innocent civilians who, who may have lost everything, but they all have a story to tell. In the same way, walking around the streets of Beirut, the city center of, of Beirut is, is it's a fantastic architectural achievement. It's been, it's been rebuilt and it is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. In the springtime, you, you can't help but delight at the, at, at the smell of the cherry blossoms and the lilac blossoms. Um, the rest of Beirut is a, something of a contrast. A lot of it is still suffering from the, from the effects of the war. There are street upon street of buildings destroyed by bombs. But those actually have their own story to tell. I was, I was recently walking in uh, a, a part of Beirut where I spent hours most days. I'd go out for lunch and I'd, I'd walk around. And there was one building that just struck me. Uh, it, it was a 1960s apartment block. And on the, I'd walked past this building hundreds of times, but something, something just stood out about it. And I stopped and I listened. I, I just looked to see what it was. And there was one apartment, two, two or three floors off the, uh, up, 
The windows have been broken in and you could see into the building. The kitchen cupboards were hanging off the walls. It was a totally derelict building. And so you have to start to think, well, why is it? Why is this one apartment block like this? And so you start to research back into the history of the area. And what, I've, and what I can assume, this was a building that was ransacked in 2006 by one of the militias. Obviously, one militia, somebody else was living inside the building. Now, there are buildings like this all across Beirut, but that particular building and all of the others, they tell a story, and they tell a story of the moment at which the, somebody's life changed. It may have changed where they had to leave, the, they had to leave and go somewhere else, or their life may have changed forever. It may have ended. But these are the stories that Beirut is just trying to tell you. And I have to listen to those stories, and I have to tell people what those stories are. Not because they need to know, but because they are telling the story of people. They're telling the story of the consequences of war. And unless we all start to listen to the consequences of war, we will never learn from them. And that's part of the reason that, to me, Beirut is, so, is such an amazing city. It's because it has so much to tell. It has so much for everyone to listen to. There is a story there for everybody. And if we were to listen to the story of Beirut, and we were to act on the story of Beirut, maybe we'd all live a slightly better life. There have been many things that have changed my life. Marrying and having a family obviously had a major impact upon, upon me and the way I live my life. But Islam also has, has significantly changed me. There was a time when I would happily climb the corporate ladder. Getting a bigger company car and a higher salary was important. But suddenly it's not important anymore. What's important is people. What's important is, is humanity and, and, and the spiritual side of life. R religion for me is personal. I'm, I'm not silent, but I don't push it. And part of the reason I don't push it is because there are people of all religions who, who, use, who use it in nefarious means. And I really don't want to be part of that. And sadly, I I Islam is misrepresented by, by so many people in the West. And so I'm using the, the journalism not just to tell the story of Palestinians, but also to try to put out the, the true message of Islam, which, which is about peace. It's about humanity. And it's about understanding other people and living side by side. And if I can achieve that to some small degree, then I think I can say that my life has been a success. Ooh.